Greetings, Monster Heads and Metal fans. Welcome to another episode of Metal and Monsters. I hope you are ready for a Texas size show, my friends. Now, Texas is where I grew up. In fact, my dad is from a little town called Round Rock where they filmed the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Before I found out it was fictionally based in Texas, I used to stay up late with the covers pulled over my head, waiting to hear the sound of chainsaws in the middle of the night. I never heard them. But being born in 1975, I was fortunately at a very impressionable age when hard rock and heavy metal came to prominence. Pantera and King's X were two incredibly important bands to the Texas music scene and would both go on to find international acclaim. When we started developing this show, we made a list of guests who were of the utmost importance to the legacies of both horror and heavy metal. Our two guests today are a couple of bass playing brothers from different mothers with Texas size sounds and talent to match. They were real icons to me growing up and it is so exciting to have Doug Pinnock from King's X and Rex Brown from Pantera with us today. Before we let the dog man out though, we gotta unleash those tunes from the crypt. By the late 1980s, the Sunshine State had become ground zero for the death metal movement. With bands such as Obituary, Deicide, and Morbid Angel creating a united front with Floridian headbangers, Chuck and his band Death developed a sound of their own that would eventually lead them to legendary status. Released in 1988, the album Leprosy was Death's pioneering second album, building upon the thrash metal sounds of Metallica and Slayer, but adding a previously unheard level of raw extremity. To celebrate this landmark album, our good friends at Relapse Records have sent us a treasure trove of goodies for all you death fans at home. We've got vinyls, CDs, cassettes, t-shirts, even Halloween masks. And for all you maniacs at home that are possessed to skate, our friends at Check Your Head Skateboards have sent us these two awesome leprosy skate decks. So there's a little death for everyone. For your chance to win, all you need to do is send your name, email, and mailing address to Metal and Monsters, attention Tunes from the Crypt, and that's P.O. Box 70191, Pasadena, California, 91117. Winners will be selected at random and announced on Gibson TV at a later date. Now coming up, we will be joined by my two friends from the Lone Star State, so stick around. Take a walk down 62nd Street, where heavy metal lives. Welcome to Lamore. Ah! Lamore, the rock capital of Brooklyn, brings you the most explosive live entertainment every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. This is where heavy metal comes alive. You haven't experienced heavy metal until you have experienced love more. Welcome back, you maniacs. We're back for another episode of Metal and Monsters. I can hardly contain myself with what's going on on stage right now. We've got three bass players with Texas roots all in one room at the same time, which according to some text might bring about the end of the world. If nothing else, it might make you deaf. Ladies and gentlemen, today we've got Mr. Doug Pinnock and Mr. Rex Brown together at last. These two guys were both on my walls as a kid, as <laughs> wow. heroes. So to be well, sitting you know, here with both of you is yeah. such a gigantic honor. I, a pleasure, I, man. My pleasure. I just, in fact, I'm wearing a King's X shirt that I got at the music hall in 1992. Wow. Man, it was you guys and Galactic Cowboys. <laughs> I want to know a little bit about 
from each of you about what your early musical influences were and what got you to pick up an instrument. Rex, you can go first. Um, it's crazy that we're in a theater like this. Um, my grandmother played the silent piano to the movies, and I was the last of 26 grandchildren. And so I would drag Granny by the hand, and she would sit and play Scott Joplin and just all the rag, you know, the, the ragland, ragtime kind of stuff. And I really, you know, from my early age of five, you know, listening to that stirred something up. What about you, Doug? What was your... For bass? Yeah, for just what was the early, what was the first music you heard that caught your ear? You know, I don't know, because my mom said I used to sing before I could talk. And when she'd put a record on, when she'd turn it off, I'd go, give me yay, give me yay. So I can only think it must have been Little Richard going, yeah, 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 or something was on the record player with a yeah, yeah, yeah in it. I just love music. I've always gravitated to it. But when I was about 10, I heard this song by Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers. It was 1957. And the bass line was just so cool. And that's the first time I noticed bass. And from that point on, it was like everything I wanted to hear was I wanted to hear the bass. And that, that was it. I didn't care about anything else. That was the, you remember the moment where you're like, yeah. bass, oh, yeah, I bass remember is the, the place. Yeah, I didn't start playing bass until I was 23. But I, I was obsessed with bass. My stereo, the bass was loud. Everybody used to say, don't go over Doug's house. You don't hear nothing but the low end. I mean, <laughs> I just loved low end. Just the bigger, the louder it was. I, I loved the way it felt. My whole family played records. Cousins, uh, aunts, uncles, everywhere I went, they had records going. Nobody played music. I mean, an instrument. But everybody played records. I'd go to my uncle's house. He'd have jazz, Kenny Burrell and Jimmy Smith and mm. stuff like that. I'd go to my cousin's house, and they'd be playing Little Richard and Chuck Berry. And I'd go to my aunt's house, another aunt's, and she'd be playing like Muddy Waters, because it was in the late 50s where the blues ex explosion was happening. So they'd go buy the records from Chicago and bring them down to Braidwood, where my little town I lived in, and play all these records. So I got to hear everything. And my great-grandmother who raised me only allowed me to listen to gospel music in, in the house. So I got a, got a chance to hear it all. Was bass the first instrument you picked up, period, at 23? Or did you try to play anything else? Yeah, I mean, seriously. I mean, I banged on the piano and didn't go anywhere because there wasn't none around. You'd come and play a couple chords, you know, and you'd figure it out at school and stuff. But I played sax for six months and when I was 12. Yeah. And so I learned a note, C, D, E, F, G. I, know, I knew those, that just a little bit of window that gave me enough information to go out and play. Uh, but that was about it. What about you, Rex? When did you first pick up a guitar? I'd played guitar since I was about nine years old. A cousin would give me a, a Gibson. I wish I still had it. You know, probably an old, you know, early 60s model. It was one of those things that, that I, I couldn't, you know, like every single note was a different chord when you're playing jazz. Or, well, since I know the bass clef, I just picked up a bass and there it was. You, I wow. knew everything that I needed to know. And that was the gateway until, you know, yeah, until today really Man. so what was the what was the first time you got on stage with a band like a bunch of guys what was your what was the first gig like I, I used to sing so much that it didn't matter i didn't know where i was i was pretty spaced out i just sang and carried my music around and listened to it and i joined a band uh and they wanted me to sing in it and i remember the first show we did was opening for ario speedwagon which Oh Their God. first record hadn't come out yet. They had the old singer, and they were from the college down the road, about two hours down the road, Springfield, uh, Illinois. So they came up, and we opened for them at the college I was going to. Uh, I was like 19, I guess, at the time. Oh my God. And when I would sing, I would just sing and then dance. Sing and dance. I just loved to dance. I'd be on the corner just boogieing it. And then come down and sing, okay, I'd sing. I just loved to hear the music. I never looked outside. And I remember at the end of the show, I heard people clapping and I looked up and the whole place was full because all the people trickled in to, to see the opening or the, the headline. But I didn't even see people coming in. I didn't even know there was people out there. So it took me probably till I was in King's X to realize that, that it snapped. What are you, you're standing in front of people. What the fuck are you doing? You know, I mean, I literally said that. It was a moment of in the middle of something and I was talking or something. I looked out in the crowd and they're all looking at me and I'm thinking, 
Mm-hmm. Like, this is what, what the fuck am I doing? And I had to sit down and think about it. I thought, who in the world am I to think I can get up in front of a bunch of people and do this? And then at that, at that point, the, you know, it went away because what I love to do, I'm going to do. And so right. the, all that shit went away and I went out and played again, you know, and never thought of it again. But uh, yeah, it's, it was never too much of a thought. That's so interesting. So you weren't like, I'm going to be a front man and be a singer, and it just, it, that's how it happened? No, never. I always wanted to be a bass player. Every band I got in, they made me sing, because either they couldn't find a singer or I was the best singer in the band or whatever. And I got used to it. So by the time I got to King's X, it was just second nature. How about you, Rex? When was the first gig? Same when was the thing, first about, band? About, uh, about 15. Uh, Neck and the Brewheads. Mm. The guitar player's <laughs> name was Lance Necker. And uh, of course, couldn't find a singer, um, and I was playing bass, and so I got the duties of lead singing, and we played all kinds of Stones and and, and Zeppelin and all kinds of crazy stuff. And we and we actually got pretty popular in the, in high school or whatever. And then I met these two brothers, the Abbott brothers, that are no longer with us. God bless them, and. That changed everything. It was, um, I'd, I'd, I'd met Benny 15 years, about the same time I joined this band. And he was playing drums in the jazz band that I went to. So it was just one of those things that kept me, you know, my dad died when I was early, like early in my life. And it just, something that kept me out of trouble, man. You know, it kept, uh, just a focal point of that's who I was. When did you wind up in Texas? Um, when King's X got together, we, um, we, because the, the Christian underground found that we were believers at that time, um, and we, put, we started playing, and so word got around all over the country. So what happened was there was this Christian record company uh, in Texas, and they, the guy called me up after five years. We were five years a band. And uh, he called me up, and he says, are you tired of playing for Satan, want to play for Jesus. He says, we'll pay you. And I go, what are you talking about? And he said, just joking. I want you guys to come down and be a band for one of our artists. They had this young Christian guy who was cute and they were trying to get a teeny bob Christian. So we went down to Texas to uh, be his band. We played with it. We did one tour with them and the churches wouldn't allow us to come back because we were too rock and roll. Wow. And, uh, and, but what happened was we stayed the record company put us on a salary and they said, well, we're going to try to get you a record deal with a regular company. Cause we said, we're not going to be a Christian band cause then we can't do what we fucking want to do. Right. You know? And we knew that would have been a kiss of death. I love going to Texas because uh, ZZ Top is one of my favorite bands. And when I heard Trace, Trace Ombres changed my life. Oh, I yeah, never heard yeah. blues like that. Cause I was listening to traditional blues all my life as a kid. Sure. And ZZ Top comes out. We're, we're the same age. They're, they're playing blues for me. You know, it was darker, it was lower, it mm. grooved harder, it was still traditional, but it had a little progressiveness to it. Yeah. And all they sung about was Texas. So I'm going, I want to go to Texas, Mexican Blackbird, and you know, yeah. Driving Wild Blind. I'm just visualizing all those songs. I did, Jesus just left Chicago. And then I get there, and we get to Houston, and I look around, and there's a whole bunch of green. Everything was green. Yeah. And I'm going, this looks like Florida, you know? And that was the first time getting to Texas, realizing how big Texas was. And one side was uh, desert and the other side was green. But then getting to know Billy Gibbons, come to find out all those stories we just made up. So it's, it's a genius of ZZ Top, are you kidding me? That's a and little... Dusty, let's not talk about Dusty. Oh I, God. I, oh man. I, I, I channel that guy all the time. I remember when, when I first heard that record, just when he go boom, 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 I'm going, He's just playing eighth notes, and it was like goosebumps. Yeah. This is awesome. Yeah. If we could have another chair right that there, yes. it would oh, be, it would be for Dustin. I would sit and listen. I would just ask questions all day long. No yeah. kidding. So you found the Abbott Brothers. Yeah. How did the band come together? Um, Vinny had a little brother named, named Daryl, and, and when I met him, at 15, he still didn't, hadn't picked up a guitar yet. And then about the time in 81, he just tucked himself away inside of, a, inside of his, his room, didn't see him for a summer, 
um, and learned all that Randy Rhodes stuff. And it, it, he came out of that bedroom and I never heard anybody. And he was a skinny little kid, man, with real tight permed hair. And it was, it, it was just like a complete metamorphosis into what he was doing. And so we, they had already had the band kind of started and playing Lover Boy and that kind of stuff and more top 40 kind of stuff. I was more in the hippie, you know, um, vibe, still am. When I joined the band, it was just right when we were, hell, I was 17 years old, you know, so it was make it or break it. And we played clubs until, you know, I got in the band in 82 and we played until 89 and met Doug in the process in 88. They had put out Silent Planet. Yeah. Out of the Silent Planet. I've seen you before, And that though. changed the world. It changed me and Dimes' whole everything. So you, you saw Rex before that? Yeah. Where at? They, when they'd come to Cardi's, oh, yeah. I'd go see them before I met them. And uh, we would just, they were doing power metal back then. You know, and it was, you know, covers Metallica, Judas Priest and stuff. And it was, they, they executed this stuff beyond anything I had ever heard or seen or felt. It was just the sheer energy and tone. They all had tones. Everything was clear. They had a sound man that I'd die for. Wow. That guy was so good. And uh, it was just when you went, you just got your face beat in yeah. in a wonderful way. And, uh, and then we met somehow. I, I got backstage to hang we out with you guys. We met at a at an end store. Y'all were doing a one to three, and That's then we right. pulled in at three to five. <laughs> and right. and we hear this this music over the over the sound system. We go, who is the fuck is this? And they go, it's King's X. They're over there in the other corner. You guys are set up over here. And we were kind of browsing to the music. And I can't remember if it was me or is it Dime that came over and got a copy. It was a music store. Sam Taylor, our manager, that was his brother's music store. Exactly. And they had an in-store of our both bands. We had a record deal and you guys hadn't been signed yet. No. And, and, and they're huge in, in the area, so yeah. there was, it was a great drawing. And Dime, I remember Dime stood in front of a amp and shredded for like an hour on 10. Wow. And, and while people just walked in, we we're all just sitting there and Dime's like, oh, hair flying, it was so cool. The way I look at Pantera is that we were doing ZZ Top, we just sped it up a thousand times faster, <laughs> yeah. you know, to yeah. get that groove. Yeah. Um, with these guys, they did it slower and heavier, but had more, had more melody. Now, if you listen to our first two records, even maybe the third record, some of it, there's a lot more melody in than what we became. Mm -hmm. So you can blame it on him. We're going to take a break. Don't go anywhere, because it might get louder. We'll be right back. <laughs> You guessed it, everybody. We've got mail. Boy, do I love getting these letters and reading all your comments and complaints. It's so fun. Once again, the Metal and Monsters P.O. Box has been filled with letters, and I wanted to share some of those with you now. To get started, someone sent in this old copy of Metal Rendezvous magazine featuring Blackie Lawless from Wasp on the front. There are articles about Armored Saint and Death Angel, complete with a loudness centerfold. Don't think that's not going in the dressing room later. Thank you, Dave. Uh, he also sent a letter. Dear Count D, I love Sepultura. My favorite album is Beneath the Remains. What's yours? Well, Dave, great question. I didn't see the band live until Chaos AD came out, but the first album from them that I heard was Arise, and I was immediately hooked and couldn't wait for them to come to my town. So great question and thank you for the magazine and for your letter. This one is from Sam. Hi, Count D, how are you? I hope this letter finds you well. I'm good, Sam, thank you. It's very difficult to pick, but my favorite movie monster has to be Dracula. I love classic black and white horror films. I love modern horror films too, but they don't create the same feeling. You're right, Sam, I feel like they show you too much sometimes. Sometimes it's what you don't see, right? Favorite metal band and album? Hmm, that's a hard question to answer. I have a soft spot for the classics though. I'd have to say Iron Maiden, Peace of Mind, and Power Slave are my favorites. What's yours? I know it's a little bit on the nose, but I love Number of the Beast. It is kind of a classic album for a reason because it's perfect. 
On a side note, I wanted to congratulate you on your book. I hope it's okay that I sent you mine. I wanted to give it to you as a gift to thank you for being awesome. Keep on rocking. Well, thank you, Sam. I will keep on rocking, and I did read your book. It's full of wonderful poetry, and I love it when you guys make the effort to send this stuff in. It means a lot to me, so keep it coming. Thank you guys so much. Over 50 years, KISS has commanded the world stage and established themselves as one of the most collectible brands in the history of rock and roll. From the makeup, comics, belt buckles, and toys, Gene Simmons has preserved his own personal KISS collection as a time capsule for generations to come. So get ready to experience the thrill of being a part of the KISS Army as we head to Las Vegas for the ultimate KISS collecting experience. Let's go. Hey there, metalheads and monster freaks, coming to you from Sin City. And today I am joined by my two favorite Canadians in the whole wide world, Mr. Todd Kearns and Mr. Brent Fitz from a little band called Slash featuring Miles Kennedy and the Conspirators. I believe you've heard of them. These two fellas are also Las Vegas locals now and happen to be ginormous Kiss fans. They kind of know Uncle Gene too. So we're here at Kiss World today, and we're gonna get our kiss on. You guys ready? I'm it. Let's go! So, guys, do you still get the feels when you walk in here? I do. I immediately yeah. turned nine years old in here. It's like my bedroom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, what was I want to know for both you guys? Kiss entry point, what happened? Probably like, you know, friends in the neighborhood, somebody has an album and they go, check this out. You see like the cover of Destroyer and you're like, what is that? It's superhero stuff. But the music then was all of a sudden like super catchy and awesome. At my age, at seven or eight, when those like Destroyer and Love Gun came out and then action figures like that. Yeah, Mego action figures. Yeah. You add superhero action figures with great music. I mean, it was pretty life-changing for, you know, a young person. My favorite band of all time because of the association with great music, but the, the merchandising was just, it hooked us, you know, it was killer. I grew up in a small town in Northern Canada where it was no access to anything, you know. We were aware of Kiss and we just sat there and we watched that you know, on television on Halloween or whatever, I was like, whoa. And every weekend we would buy Kiss records with our allowance money. My brother disagrees with me, but I'm pretty sure we bought Gene Simmons' solo album as our first Kiss album. But it was just kind of like that album. Yeah. Really, I don't know what's here, but you know, just his face was like, whoa. But it was immediately Kiss Alive and you know, every weekend to that point, we just amassed that, that collection. And once they had you at a certain age, they got you for life. And I'm one of those living examples. I had an older brother and you took the 10 plus years older. So I, I had Gene posters that I saw in his walls and I was like, that guy's scary. And then one day I heard something and I saw the picture at the same time and I went, oh, wait a minute. The superhero aspect yeah. uh, and, but they play music, that was, you couldn't lose. Yeah. But you walk in here and you go, oh yeah, I forgot what this band means to the world. Yeah, absolutely. And people everywhere, and the yeah. handmade stuff that Gene Captain is. There's actually. people's basements that look like this, honestly. I am here with my new friend, Christina Vitaliano. What's going on in here? A lot goes on in here. Um, this is Kiss World Las Vegas at the Rio Hotel and Casino. Indoor black light Kiss themed mini golf. Wow. It's Kiss retail shop and some memorabilia, a Kiss wedding chapel an event room for corporate events and parties, and then we are standing in the Gene Simmons Kiss Museum. Now, how long did it take to put this together? The museum part, this is about a year. Gene said, hey, I'm thinking about putting all of my memorabilia into your venue. Um, do you guys have a place to put it? Uh, about 10 days later, six tractor trailer trucks arrived here. <laughs> <laughs> now, was there a toy or something that you had that wasn't a record? Was there a piece of merchandise that you had when you were a kid that you saw in here or that you 
Well, yeah, I mean, the Mego figures for sure. Yeah, that's a Those big were a big deal. I don't think I had all four. I think it was kind of like, again, I lived in Nowheresville, so yeah. I would come across one or two of them. I had Ace and Gene. I never had the record player. That was something I really wanted. That looks like, that's that's pretty special. That's very special. I come on, the van, the Chevy the van. van. Oh, man. And the radio. The oh, radio is super coveted, yeah. That was was that a love gun radio? Is that I think so. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Belt buckles, I remember the belt buckles, like this one. Kiss played up Canada all the time. Very impressive for a band, because not all our heroes got to come up to Canada, but right. Kiss played, you know, regularly. Like we did not see them on the Love Gun tour. No. We were just under that With that Cheap Trick and Kiss. That would have been the greatest thing ever, but we were oh, too man. young. Oh, I wow. saw them with Dawkin, yeah. he saw them with Greensreich. Wow. <laughs> If that puts it in perspective, yeah. What do you hear from KISS fans while they're here or as they're leaving? What is, what is the, what's the commentary you get back from? They walk in and they're just, just amazed, like, holy cow, there's so much stuff in here. They like it because they can relate. It just brings them on the same level as an actual KISS fan member. I have this, Gene has this, isn't this cool? And then once in a while, you'll see somebody go, I gave that to Gene. That's priceless. So if you're gonna squeeze a pinball machine into your house, this is probably the one you need. Absolutely. And now, Todd, you did squeeze one into your house. I did indeed. I have the best wife in the world because this is sitting in our living room right now. 1978, they made these in just your average arcade. And as a child, we'd walk in and be like, oh, when we talk about the superhero thing, this image alone I know, says these guys are superheroes. And there's fire and blood and lasers and stuff. And I mean, First time I saw a kid's pinball machine was at the Dairy Scoop by my house. <laughs> and it would just be such a big deal. Like all the kids would be you'd just like wait in line to play the game. But there's emotional attachment to these Honestly. things. Like the new Kip Kiss Pinball, which is just behind this, which is an amazing new game. But there's the emotional attachment to the, the original, right? Yeah, yeah. It's cruder. It might not play as fancy as anyone, but it doesn't matter. So tell me about the first time you walked in this room. What, what was going through your mind? It's a lot of got it, got it, need it, need it, got it. <laughs> There's a lot of that nerd going on. And there's a lot of like, I didn't know they made Russian dolls. I didn't need You know, that's the thing, you know, but I'm not ashamed to say I have a lot of this stuff. There's some things that, I mean, certainly merchandise wise that people could buy that everyone could collect, but there's the personal gene items yeah. and kiss related things. Like there's a wedding cake topper up there. There's, yeah, you know, some of Gene's uh, high school diplomas and whatnot. Like that's very, that's you want to come here to check that out. Now, do you have a favorite item in the store that you have to you have to see? Wow, <laughs> there's so many items. This is overwhelming. But I I'm partial to the items that fans made that have given him over the years, or awards that have come from fans or towns or cities across the you know, United States and the world. That's I think what makes this particular collection unique because it's his. Okay, so this explains a little bit of a mystery. Because when we walked in today, I saw some dress to kill cake toppers. Yes, yes. And I can't imagine those ever being like no. an item with a skew. No. So that was hand, that was fan. Yeah, there's so many items up this. But there's the Muppets up there, you know, the oh, yeah. Muppets. Those are fan made. There's a lot of fan made items. Wow. And then if you look at them, or if I say, hey, Gene, where'd this come from? They'll say, wow, that came back in, on, in the 80s that we were traveling so and so, and this person gave that to me. It's almost Halloween, my favorite time of year. And you know what? I don't have any of these masks. Did you guys have these? I grew up in the freezing cold, so you'd be in a snowsuit with you know, the costume on and then like Batman and it'd be like, it'd be basically Batman if he was in the Arctic North. But back then, they would make these kind of like basically plastic, super fire retardant uh, costumes that didn't really have anything to do with Kiss costumes. And then their faces. I like the way the hair and then there's like a fur lining to the hair. You notice that? Yeah, yeah. As much as those were okay, I think we all actually just wore real makeup. I think people just put makeup yeah. on. Like I always so. dressed up every Halloween as a Kiss member. But again, Todd and I, this Canadian thing keeps coming up. When you're wearing your snowsuit <laughs> with your yeah. outfit. I've seen Simmons in the snow. Yeah, yeah. It's a factor. <laughs> it's a, it is a factor. Well, there are makeup kits in here somewhere. Oh, so yeah, they, yeah, they, they actually are. sold Kiss makeup kits. So that was a whole thing. I had too. puzzles too. Puzzles, puzzles rad. Yeah. Oh, that puzzles are amazing. This guitar is kind of a big deal too. We just got to mention that. Yeah, that guitar was a big deal. Yeah. That guitar was super rare. I want to talk about Gene's acting career. Absolutely. What was the first thing you saw him in? Runaway. Runaway. Yeah. Runaway. yeah. Ramsey. 
And there with, it is. Uh, Tom Selleck, Kirstie Alley, One Dead or Alive with Rutger Hauer. Yes. That was another one. And then, of course, Trick or Treat, where he played the DJ in that one, which yes. was a really cool heavy yes. metal movie that you had to see. Technically, they were acting in Kiss Meets the Phantom. Star Child. Star that was acting. I know. That was acting. That was one of the scariest pictures I ever saw, Gene. He had the hood on, and he was sitting in this, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, terrifying. Oh, I know. I always thought he would have made a great Bond villain. Totally. I mean, I think in a lot of ways, I think Runaway and Water They're Alive were sort of loosely based on that kind of a yeah. idea. But yeah, no, I think he perfectly just got out slid right into being a villain because he sort of portrays that in, in Kiss anyway as sort of the, the demon character. Now, are these original props? Is that the original gun, the original spider robot from Runaway? I it mean, it really looks like it. it really does. That's yeah. sure they are. Yeah. I don't know if you can see everything, honestly. Every time I come here, I feel like I'm seeing something new. If only there was somebody who like, knew something about, you know, maybe lives in Vegas. Oh my God. Hey! You mean like this guy? Don't let anybody in here. Yeah. Eric Singer, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your resident uh, Kiss Vegas um, aficionado. There you go. There you go. He's telling us to keep our fingers off the glass. So how long have you been in the band now? 25, six, seven years total. Damn. Wow. I, I've been in, the, in and out of the band three times, as most people that are Kiss fans know. I saw them on their first tour where they opened for the New York Dolls at, wow. at the um, Allen Theater in Cleveland, April 74. You know, Gene always... Like, every time when we'd be on tour, he'd always tell his assistant or somebody, I want you to get up every morning and go out and get check the local newspapers for reviews, you know, every, any clippings. He would save everything, and he'd cut it out and keep it nice and organized, and then he used to ship them to his mom's house. His mom kept them all stored there. So a lot of that stuff was at his mother's house, but he made, basically made scrapbooks of all, every newspaper clipping, magazine article, reviews, posters, you name it. Which leads me to my next question. Now I think I know the answer. Is this tour that's going on right now really the end? Yep, it is. I know a lot of people go, I don't believe it. I'm like, no, it is, I'm telling you. It's like athletes, the same thing. My father's time is undefeated. So at some point, you gotta stop. There'll be some, I don't know, I don't wanna say version of Kiss, but there'll be some way Kiss will be involved in people's wives because I don't see how it could just die that easy. Well, no, and, and now and you see it here. Yeah, it's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. Whatever you do, don't miss the band on their last tour. You can get all your tickets and info at kissonline.com. Don't miss it, folks. This is it. And I want to thank my guests, Eric Singer, Brent Fitz, and Todd Kearns for coming by and hanging out with us. I want to thank Christina for having us here at Kiss World. And I want to thank Uncle Gene for saving everything and sending it to Mom's house so we can come rummage through it and play and have fun and be kids again. This was an awesome day. Can't thank you guys enough for being here. Thank you. We're back with Doug Pinnock and Rex Brown, both of which will have statues next to Buddy Holly in Texas oh, 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 <laughs> at some point. Oh, if they don't, me. I'm writing a letter. I'll write two. <laughs> I have to backtrack a little bit. How did you and Ty and Jerry meet? Meet? Yeah. Uh, in Springfield, Missouri. It was a college town. Uh, I joined another Christian band called Petra. And they asked oh, yeah. me, to, wow. yeah, they asked me to uh, go to Springfield, Missouri, to live with the lead singer Greg Bowles, and uh, they had found Jerry, and he was going to be the drummer. They were looking for a rhythm section, so Jerry was going to school there, and he was married uh, at the college there. So um, when I moved down there, I met Jerry, and the band broke up before we even rehearsed, and I was stuck there. I go, I don't know what to do, and so they found a little place for me to live, and for a few months paid my rent. And in that meantime, Jerry and I and the lead singer for Petra joined up with Phil Kagey. We, we played with him for about nine months and then he let us go. <laughs> and uh, we, I went back to Springfield and I said, Jerry, we wanna stick, we're, we're gonna stick together. And he goes, yeah. And I go, okay, I'm gonna find a guitar player. And uh, we started looking around for guitar players and uh, Jerry had already jammed with Ty and, and I didn't know it. And I went to a Spring Fling uh, musical it's called and Ty got out and played 
uh, hit me with your best shot. And I wouldn't pay any attention. He's 18 years old. He had his guitar hanging low, and, and he just looked cool. And when they got to the lead, he did his lead, his signature lead. It's always, I mean, he's, ne he's always played that way. And I remember I said to my friend, I said, who's that guy? And so we asked a few questions and got his number. And we called him up and said, hey, want to jam with us? And uh, we hung out for about a year. And then we finally decided, let's be a band. And that's when, you know, great choice. <laughs> yeah. no, no kidding. Right. Sam Taylor finds you guys. You guys are cooking. You're both aware of each other. Yeah. What was interesting about, and I kind of experienced the, mu the Houston music scene, and I was 15 in 1990, so I kind of caught the tail end of the cool part of it. Oh. But it really seemed like, at the time, a scene that supported itself. There were places to play for original bands, and all the bands knew each other. It was such a small community. You guys were literally signing records in the same record store on the same day, that, that, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Were you aware that you were influencing bands? Like, were you guys, was, were you getting that back already that early? The only thing I got back was the only thing was when Gretchen came out, we went on a seven month tour and watching Headbangers Ball, you had Bon Jovi, Rat, Poison, everybody was on there. When we came back, almost every band was down-tuned. Mm. And that's when I went, I don't know what's going on here, but this is what we're doing. And I, it just kind of made me happy, you know, and all of a sudden I became the biggest grunge fan ever, you know, because that, you know, we all went down, you know, and that just changed everything to, to the point where the whole world down tuned. And yeah. so I, I don't want to take credit for it, but I know that I didn't see a whole lot of it happening before that. And it was happening, though, because Killing Joke did uh, on their nighttime record. There's a couple tunes on there. Yes. And, uh, you know, The Cult, I think, did, too. Yeah. And The Cult was a big deal for me because when we heard She's So Sanctuary, that's kind of kicked us. Me and Ty both, we just said... We're trying to do this U2 ACDC thing. That was in our mind, you know, and they just nailed it. And so we went, okay, let's keep on moving, <laughs> you know. They always talk about our harmonies. I always thought we had this badass groove, but whenever somebody says King's X, they go, oh, your harmonies. I used to think our harmonies, when, I, when we put harmonies on over top of heavy grooves, it got too pretty for me. I thought, <laughs> King's X makes everything pretty. You know, I got this badass riff, Power of Love, and all of a sudden we come on and it's like uh, butterflies are flying as soon as the three of us start singing, you know. <laughs> okay, so I wasn't, I wasn't at the show, but tell me, tell me the story, the Cowboys from Elstie. Yeah, I love to set it up because we had been going to see these guys a lot. And they're just rocking. They're, they're really hard and just straight up metal. And we went to see them one night, Galactic Cowboys too. We were all there. And uh, they came on stage and just started Cowboys from Hell. Did the whole album, walked off the stage. Everybody was speechless. We had never heard anything like it. It was a music that we had never heard before. It was total Texas. It just fucking blew our minds. And we all went home thinking, where are we going to go from here? It was like, <laughs> they set that bar so high, we didn't know what to do. You Next know, level. The shows that they did, I'd walk away with my head down going, man. And I remember Vinny was telling me, what was it, Vulgar Display? He said, you guys in the studio, and you, I mean, you had Walk, and you had all these songs. I think it was an album. You guys are fucking great songs. And then, then uh, uh, Phil comes in and starts screaming. And, and Vinny said, he took him aside and said, dude, we got all these great songs here, man, and you're screaming on it. You know, you usually sing, what's up? And he says, no, trust me, kids want to hear this. And then Vinny said, how many million records later? He says, well, I guess he was right. Yeah. You know, speaking of that night when, when we did that, I don't, Phil didn't say anything in between songs. No, not a word. Not a word. It's always or, talk. Or after the show. Yeah. We just dropped our instruments, let it feed back, and walked off. Mm -hmm. And I don't even think we came back for an encore. No, you didn't. I, just I ran back and said, <laughs> what the fuck? And I think there was a write-up in the paper. Somebody was there. Mm. You know, we, our first tour was Suicidal Tendencies and Exodus. And you have to go out in front of a suicidal tendencies crowd. You better have your feet on the floor and you better be stopping. They were furious back then. That's a tough room. And Rocky George is a friend of ours. Yeah. And he had an advanced copy of Gretchen. Uh, goes to Nebraska. And 
I, I had to dub one, you know, because I had to hear it. I had to play it for dying. Man, there was nothing but King's X for two years running through our heads. You know, I was telling Doug downstairs when we met, We, you know, we spent more time talking downstairs and being friends than we have than, you know, upstairs on the deck. That's true. We're sitting on the couch watching the circus. Right, <laughs> right. Like I was, oh, and I was saying, I had pictures of you guys on my walls. That's real shit because there was so much pride, hometown pride, KLOL. Yeah. Yeah. For KLOL. Yeah. Man, sure. Ed, talk about every hour on the hour. When Faith, Hope, Love came out, you guys were in rotation, yeah. man. Like you got some big love. So did you guys. When Cowboys yeah. came out, I mean, it was like, hometown heroes is like we had a third ZZ top. Yeah. You know, a second and third ZZ top to be crazy. out of. They got a lot more airplay than we did just because it was, I don't know, the, the harmonies and just the exceptional uh, vocals on it. Um, we hardly ever got any MTV or radio recognition whatsoever. And I think that's what, you know, kind of, you know, kind of going back to what I was talking about earlier, that's what, well, if we can get it that way, we're going to get it through the fans. I know that it started quite a while back, but I just saw a recent one. You were playing Goldilocks, and you turn the mic where the crowd could sing it. And as many times as I've watched that video, it's just Ty playing the guitar. No drums, no bass. And the crowd is singing this verbatim. First verse, first chorus, second verse, second chorus, third verse, third chorus. And every time I do my, I just have tears flowing down my face. Being in one of those bands and having fans like that, that was the biggest payoff of all. Wow. I told Rex outside earlier, I'm gonna go on record here with all these cameras and say, Goldilocks is easily the greatest love song ever written. I sang Goldilocks in his wedding. Get out. Really? Yeah, I'm, I got them to play our my wedding. Greatest love song ever written. A lot of your songs hit these notes, but you guys really had a superpower to hit the nerve of the human condition and what makes people tick and really putting your fingers on not just broad emotions people feel, but even specific moments, and that the love story in that song is unresolved. Yeah. So and so doesn't necessarily get so and so. We don't know. But the observation and the way that observation is performed is supernatural. Wow. I th I think. Absolutely. I mean, no, I don't speak for itself. itself. Seriously, where does that come from? I mean, I'd say, I, I, I feel ridiculous even asking that question. No, I've always worn my heart on my sleeve. Uh, as a kid, I've, I've, I have always been told to shut up, stop telling everything. I'm a truth teller. And I've always been, I always see the, something that's a little off. It's just the way I am. And growing up, I've had my, like everybody else, they've had their traumatic childhood, you know. So, so it kind of... Uh, I have all these feelings and, you know, depression like anybody else does, but I want to figure out why I feel the way I do. Yeah. What brought it? Where did it come from? How did it get here? And how can I fix it? That's everything I look at in my life that way. So I think about it, you know, and I come to find out that some of the things people feel, they're feeling the same thing. Yeah. The other thing was out of loneliness. I just used to sing about stuff going, I, this is how I feel. Does anybody else feel this way? It's just always been that way. It's ever since I sang, I've watched people cry while I sing as a child when I could, you know, I mean, before grade school, when I would, they'd get me up to sing, my relatives or someone say, Dougie, sing this song. And I would, somebody come by with tears in their eyes and go, Dougie, just keep doing what you're doing, you know? And I just said to go, I just want to play with my friends. I don't know what's going on. Right. So there's something that goes on that I don't know about, but I keep doing it because I love to do it. And with that, we're going to take a break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. The night of the fall is finally here for Chris, Cindy, and JC. It's going to be the best night of their lives. But tonight is also the night of the creeps. 
from a world unknown comes a nightmare unimagined. First, they are under you, around you, on you, and then inside you. They get into your mouth and you walk around while they incubate, even if you're dead. They are a new breed of terror. Freeze! They are a different kind of horror. Zombies, exploding heads, creepy crawlies. We could have a little problem. The creeps are taking over. Oh, I got good news and bad news, girls. What? The good news is your dates are here. What's the bad news? They're dead. You have never had a night like this. <coughs> night of the creeps. If you scream, you're dead. Doesn't matter how good you think you are at your profession, there's always somebody better. Somebody who's willing to try harder. Somebody who will learn as much as they possibly can to be a monster of their trade. The subject of today's Exhume from the Tomb really learned how to do it all. For years he has served as the most sought after professor in the world of film for those who want to learn about the craft. He's also managed to single-handedly discover some of the biggest talent in the industry while giving us hours of movie magic that made our wildest dreams come true. But more importantly, he opened the hearts and minds of filmmakers and moviegoers around the globe. This is Roger Corman. I remember I saw, when I was young, very young, Frankenstein, and what impressed me, which has become, of course, a very famous scene, Frankenstein meets the little girl. Or I should say Frankenstein's monster meets the little girl. And you assume, of course, he's going to kill the little girl but instead he befriends the little girl. And that scene really impressed me. I studied engineering at Stanford, hoping to follow in my father's footsteps, but about half or three quarters of the time through, I grew a little less interested in engineering. And I was writing for the Stanford Daily. And I found out that they had two critics, film critics for the Daily, and they both got free passes to all the theaters in Palo Alto. And at that point, I started to look at films more intently. I got a job delivering the mail at 20th Century Fox for $32.50 a week. A little later, I was given the chance to become a reader. I was getting a reputation for turning down everything I ever read. And the story editor called me in and he said, you never praised anything. Give me something worthwhile and I can work on it. We submitted a script called The Big Gun. They had a commitment with Gregory Peck, which they had to use in a certain amount of time. And I really liked The Big Gun. Uh, they bought the script, used my notes, and they changed the name to The Gunfighter, starring Gregory Peck which became a classic Western and started my career. With no training whatsoever, I decided, I looked at what the directors were doing and I thought, I can do that. So I became a director. Suddenly I was getting offers all around as a director and my career took up from there. Vincent and I worked together very well. I sent him the script of Fall of the House of Usher and he liked it and suggested we met. We met and had lunch, and we talked about our, our thoughts, uh, the old uh, cliche, uh, the character momentum. So working with Vincent was a very efficient way to go because our thinking was so much the same. And of course, before shooting, I made a point, we'd meet and we'd talk and discuss the character and so forth. So if there was some slight difference, that was worked out before shooting. I think it was the set of the Raven. We had one of the best sets we ever had. I went to Vincent and asked him if he'd like 
to play the lead. He said he liked to do it, but he was going on an art lecture tour. He was a great connoisseur of art. So I went to the next room and I asked Boris, and Boris said yes. And so uh, Boris shot the two days, and then Jack Nicholson, who was playing the lead, grabs Boris and says, I've been lied to every day since I've come to this castle. Tell me what's really going on. And so we made up a whole story that Boris, who was the Baron von Klepp, or something like that, wasn't really the Baron. He had killed the Baron and taken his place, which was not in the original script whatsoever, but it tied things up together. I would say it was one of the more interesting films I ever made, but not the best. I was shooting on short schedules, one picture I made for two and a half days at the Little Shop of Horrors. I hired everybody for a week and we rehearsed, and those rehearsals were down to every move had been set in advance. So we were able just to go in and shoot like that. I didn't really know much about working with actors, so I thought I should enroll in an acting class to simply learn acting. And in that class were two guys who became friends of mine, which were Jack Nicholson and Bob Town. I started working with Jack. I don't know how many pictures we did together. I remember saying to him one time, Jack, I believe you're really a good actor, but you keep working with me. Nobody seems to recognize your ability. And he said, they will. There was a Japanese producer who came to me. She had the rights to Piranha, but she didn't have all of the financing. And she wanted to make it with us. That was Joe Dante's debut, and Parada was a major success for us. Sylvester Stallone played Machine Gun Jack McGurk in Death Race 2000. David Carradine was the lead, and I thought, Sly is really a good actor. I'm going to hire him again. During the shooting, he was telling me he was working on a script and went along to play the lead. That was Rocky, and I never got a chance to work with Stallone again. Disco was hitting, so I came up with the title Disco High. You could put high school or high any way you wanted to interpret it. And I hired Alan Arkish to write and direct it. And at the end of the picture, the students blow up their high school. And Alan came to me and said, you can't blow up a high school to disco music. It's got to be rock and roll. So I came up with a new title, Rock and Roll High School. It started with simply hiring guys who worked with me, who I thought could be good directors, like uh, Francis Coppola, like Marty Scorsese, Ron Howard, or Jonathan Demme. It's amazing how many of them went on to be Academy Award winners. Uh, and actually, I take great pride in uh, uh, how well they've all done and we've all remained friends. So it's been a nice, uh, nice number of years. When I was working as a director, we were working with big, heavy equipment. The making of films has become very much easier. So you can just jump right in if you've just got a small amount of money and maybe working with friends who are gonna come along and you give them a participation or something, you can make your own low-budget independent film. Plan your picture in advance so you have every shot worked out. You discuss the roles with the actors, knowing, however, you'll probably change that plan a little bit or you get a better idea. I think it's a little bit more difficult to get it shown but at least you can get that film produced. Actually, you've got five cameras working here. When you leave, I could be in here tomorrow morning with your five cameras.
we're back with more with Doug Pinnock and Rex Brown, Texas four string legends on one stage at the same time. Give me a most memorable moment for each of you in the band where you, you were enjoying your success, the band was firing on all cylinders. Was there a record? Was there a moment? Yeah, I think we were sitting on uh, on Bulger and we were sat on it for about four months before it came out and we knew what we had. And we pulled teeth and hair and everything else out to get to where we wanted to do. You know, we always had to get out and, and, and be with the people, man. You know? Um, and, and a lot of bands didn't do that. And I think that's what separated us um, in those early days of, of, of what we had to do. And that, that went on for, you know, we would do in stores in every city for, you know, just about every other day off. There was an air of accessibility with you guys always, and still is to a point too, with like, with just speaking to you, you're, you're a very accessible person. And when I've run into Phil, He's been very accessible. Like, but I remember being as, as a kid, like you guys, you guys were very much a band of the people. You all, you were out after the shows talking to everybody. Like you put in that time and it made such a big difference, especially like to the up and coming guys. The fact that you guys could be, you know, you could get your autograph and you could meet you somewhere and, and, and you guys were doing in stores and clinics and stuff like that. It, it really like, was so inspiring. I think it's one of those things that, that uh, since we didn't have all the radio player and TV, that that's the only way that we could, get, we could do it. And we built up a huge following. But um, humility, you just had to be yourself, man. That's all you got, yeah. you know? Be the best of yourself. Right. At the end of the day, y'all had mojo. Though. Absolutely. And a little mojo. Had mojo. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't need radio. They. It proves it. Yeah, you know? Doug. How about for you? What's a what? Do you, when you look back on, I mean, your career as a whole, really. But is there a moment with King's X that you're so proud of? Is there a record that is there? Can you pull one moment out? <laughs> one era. <laughs> There's a whole lot of them. Yeah. Um, because you got to understand, King's X has always been the underdog. Yeah. We're the guys that didn't sell any records. We're the guys that. All our friends are in the country club, but we can only get in if we're with the friends that are in the country club. So for me, our whole career is still uphill. You know, I look at it as a journey. It's been a wonderful journey. You know, a lot of people ask, well, how did you feel when you made it or how long do you plan on doing this? And I say, no, I've been doing this all my life. And that's just what's gonna happen until I can't. And so, Every moment for me is real special. There's different special moments from playing Woodstock to just being lucky to be in places where history was being made and we're just playing in that town, you know? Um, a lot of that. Um, wow. And I think the biggest for me to answer that question is it's, it's ongoing. I'm still doing what I do and I'm okay. Yeah. So. I can't complain. I just look back at the whole history and smile and go, man, this is this. Oh, the only thing I can tell young people is it's, it's an adventure. You know, it's all an adventure. There's no up, down, in, out. It's just your life. It's your life. And at the end of it, you look back and see what you did to get to where you got, what you did good, what you didn't do good, and you reckon with it mm -hmm. and go, hey, that was my life and I'm here. Right. I'm happy as hell doing what I'm doing. I'm just lucky to be alive yeah. and in love and, and healthy, you know? It's so cool to see you, A, so comfortable and so at peace, but also to see where you've got that tap going, that musical tap. You know, man, I'll just take it a day at a time, you know, and that's all you really can do in life. And that's really been a, a, a point of mine lately. Let's take today. Yeah. Yeah. Let's make the best we can do today. Right. That's what I used to do back then. Let's make that, do that again. Even though I didn't know what I was doing back then, <laughs> I figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> I can't thank you both 
enough for being here. Thank you. What, what a beautiful day this is. Just the two heaviest things that ever passed through or came out of Texas <laughs> together again. Rex Brown, Doug Pinnock, thank you both so much. You're welcome. Much, much love to you both. That's it for this episode of uh, Metal and Monsters. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. <laughs>